actively working towards salvation. I'm going to say a lot of things in this, and again, this is an open format. This isn't closed if we have any questions. Uh, my wife, she's a good help me. She can help answer questions. Um, we can discuss things. I do want to get some things out because I don't want us to miss uh, this time period that we're in with our kids. If we, if we miss these windows, it's going to get harder as they get older. Um, there is a window to catch their heart. And I know that some people would tell us, well, Brother Puckett, there's no scriptures or scripture that talks about a salvation prayer. And that's true. There's not. But there's all kinds of scriptures that talk about salvation. And the Bible's full of men needing salvation, women needing salvation, that we need to be saved. Um, and we're going to go into a lot of points tonight, but first I want us to write this down. We have to have an attitude of a humble learner. See, if we have the attitude of a humble learner, we'll be able to receive uh, whatever the Lord wants to give us in whatever setting we're in. The opposite of a humble learner is a prideful know-it-all. That's the opposite of a humble learner, is a prideful know-it-all. And I don't want to be that. I've been that. Um, but I don't want to be that any longer. Um, a, a kind of an example of uh, humble learning. You know, how many of us here, when we, like Abby started it off by asking, what's the recipe? She asked you if I can get the recipe for that. All right, how many here, when you taste something that's really good, a dessert, a meal, or whatever it is, you go to that person that made it and say, hey, can I get that recipe? Why do we do that? We want to mimic. We want to produce what we just tasted. We want to reproduce that. You know, it's amazing. We'll go to Google, <laughs> Pinterest, Facebook, all those things to get ideas of how to do things in our lives, and, and we'll follow it to the letter. You know, if they say, if you're trying to make something, they say, glue this here, or glue that there, we're going to do exactly every step they say. You know, it gets difficult when it comes to Christianity. It's kind of funny that we can be taught all the right things to do in all the right ways, but we won't follow it step by step. We'll maybe go past a step that we think, well, that's not important. Um, like when you're baking a cake, let's just think, Brother Gary would say the sugar is not important. <laughs> right? It's not that important. And, but really, it wouldn't be a cake then. It would be a bread. You know, it would be bread. It wouldn't be a cake. The sugar makes it the cake. So the ingredients what makes what we're going after. Um, and I, I told Brother Gary Air this on our trip, and I'll tell all you. There's three things if I built a church from the ground up that I'd build the church with. Three absolute tools. Number one is the Word of God. The second tool is this one right here, to pursue the godly seed. I would build a church with these two. And then the third one, believe it or not, is a message by... A, a pastor named Dr. Smith, and if you wanted to know exactly who he is, I had to find out. But he preached a message about changing the heart of a rebel. Dr. Smith, our pastor Smith. Um, Davis, sorry, Dr. Davis. I said Smith, Dr. Davis. I always want to call him Smith. You can find it on there, yeah. He, it's YouTube. He preaches a message on changing the heart of a rebel. And he talks about children that are rebelling against their parents. And, and really, it's, it's hands down. He's got some nuggets in there, what, the things he's explaining. And I would use those three tools, building a church. I say that because the Word of God is sufficient. 
It is sufficient. But then there's other gifts that God gives people that they, they have an ability to dissect what this is saying and put it in everyday life so that we can understand it in a greater way. So I will say this, if, and this is just my personal take on it. If you have this at home and you're not using it, you're missing out. I mean, you're missing key recipe book here, man. This is like mama's recipe book handed down from generations upon generations. Um, this is, it, it's got so much in it, and it, the way it paints the picture, it uses the Word of God. The Word of God's all through here. The Scriptures are all through here. But the way he breaks it down and explains it to you, man, it makes it so practical, something that you know you can do every single day of your life. You can apply it. It's a manual. It's not a one-time read. It's not a just, oh, I'll read it. I got it. Great. It's a manual. You know, you look back. Okay, so what do I do here? What do I do there? Um, I'll read this to you that's in here. Uh, it says, uh, this is the work of the ministries, what this is under. It said, God is calling you as parents to your responsibilities, but you have to be willing to be real Christians full time. You have to be the real thing at home. You must be one who walks with God when the doors are shut and no one is watching but your children. One who will live a godly example with a fire in your heart at home. If you will get consumed with raising your children and living out the principles of the word at home, God can do something just as I have described. He is no respecter of persons. You could have a ministry that reaches much further than you ever imagined possible. You do not have to be a preacher to do it. It's a great burden to me when I see preachers sacrificing their children and the time it takes to raise them right to be famous preachers. A godly home has a much more powerful effect than good sermons do. Some of you may have a hard time believing that God would work in this way with you. Without a vision, the people perish. But with a vision, God's work prospers unto the third and fourth generation. Um, so he, he breaks that down to let us know that it, it, it is something we can do. Um, and right now, we're all approaching, um, some of us are approaching critical ages, um, where salvation is an absolute paramount ingredient that needs to be already established. If we're just now getting to it and they're 13, 14, 15 years old, we're a little behind. We're a little behind because, again, the crucial years are from the time they start to walk I'm going to tell you to the time they're about 10 or 13. All the groundwork, we should have a lot of ground already covered by that point. And at that point, they begin to grow in a different area. And we'll be doing different things to help them. But I'll write these things down for us. Um, Mom and dad in unity in all things. A home must have mom and dad in unity in all things. If our children are going to get this and go on with it. Mom and dad have to be unity, unified in all things. Uh, this ain't your life and my life anymore. Uh, this, ain't, I mean, this ain't her life and, and then I get to live my life. It's our lives together that matter. And really, the husband sets the convictions in the direction of the home. We said that in a couple of child trainers back. He sets the convictions in the direction of the home. Um, if our convictions are different, um, it creates issues. And our children will pick up on that. And our children will know which one they're going to favor because they kind of agree with those issues like my mommy does or like my daddy does. And they'll favor that parent more than the other one. And you'll begin to develop a division inside your home. And that's not going to be healthy in the getting our children on the path of salvation. And I want to say that to us. We're trying to get our children on the path to salvation. That's the goal. Not to lead them in salvation. I'm trying to get my children to a path of salvation. And that starts from the time they're one. We're trying to get their feet on that path, going in that direction. In order to do that, mom and dad have to be a united front in that area. We have to be in agreement. The number one priority of this home is getting our children on the path of salvation. Not to get my child to say a, 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 um, a salvation prayer, but to get them on that path. Go ahead. I'm sorry to do something. Okay. Just real quick, what, what, what does it look 
like when you put somebody on, what is the child saying or um, expressing when the parents have put them on the path of salvation as opposed to bringing to salvation? What does that look like? We're going to get through there. Yeah, we'll get there. Um, because really, I think they're both one and the same. See, we're bringing them to salvation, but we're bringing them to a path. There's nothing we can do to save our children. Nothing. You know, we, all we can do is get them in the right direction to receive salvation from God. That's what we're to do. Um, and that has to start from the time they enter the world. We're, we're actively pursuing their lives to get them on that path as soon as possible. Because the longer they're off that path, that means the longer they're on the path they were started off in. What's the path they start off in? The path unto death. They're on it. You know, if they walk from age one to the time they're 16 or 17 on that path and we hadn't gotten them off that yet, man, we are going to be, as a famous way I say it, up the creek without a paddle. Because now they have concluded some things in their minds and that ground has established some root systems already in that path. So I don't want to get too far ahead, but that's, we're going to get there. And I would say this to everybody. It's not the church's responsibility to disciple your children. It's not the church's responsibility, nor is it the ministry's responsibility to disciple your children. It's ours as mothers and fathers. It doesn't mean that coming to church with our children, the ministry's not helping that discipleship process. They are. It doesn't mean that our pastors aren't helping us in that discipleship process. They are. But when it comes down to it, it's our job to be discipling our children towards the path of salvation. And that means... I'm going to say a lot, so I'll slow down because you've got to write a lot. <laughs> yeah. that, that means that our focus as parents should be the salvation process. That's our focus. That's our focus to get our children on that path as soon as possible. Um, that takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of diligence. Um, it takes a lot of want to. See... And we're going to get into some, it takes a lot of details that, you know, that are absolutely crucial. See, these are development in years, developmental years in their life. Um, right now, whether we believe this or not, they are determining which direction they're going in. They're determining that. You know, what we do in these windows is going to, like if you put an arrow in a bow, and you start to aim that arrow, once that gets a locked position, it's determined where it's going. And you can let it off and you want it to go over here, but it's locked in this position over here. It's hard to change that now. That's why our children, when they come out as soon as possible into this world, get them locked on the goal. Don't wait three, five, ten years because we think they just can't understand or we think they can't reason the scriptures. You get them as soon as possible locked in on that goal and you keep them there as long as you can because there's a day coming that they're going to look off the goal. They're going to look off of it. And we got to have enough roots they've built in them that keep them on that path. Even though they look off of it, they won't get off of it. See, it's a difference to just look off over there and see what's out there than to walk over in there to taste what's out there. There's a difference in that. You know, we want them so rooted and grounded they don't want off the path. And that's between them and the Lord at some point. But what we're doing in these crucial years is going to help determine that how hard their life is going to be to be saved. Um, so our focus should be the salvation process, working to bring our children to a place of knowledge. See, we're working, actively working, to bring our children to a place of knowledge where they have heard about who they really are. That's the carnal man. See, we... Brother Hummel used to say this to his children. He used to call them heathens. Okay. It worked. You know, 
Now, I don't know that sitting down and calling them heathens is what the Lord desires us to do. I think that's the same concept. We've got to get them to a knowledge of who they are. As soon as possible, they realize I'm, I'm carnal. Um, and then from there, we've got to show them their need to be saved from all sin. See, we, we've got to get them to that place as soon as possible. The longer we delay, the higher the risk gets. The longer we delay, the higher the risk gets. What do I mean by the higher the risk gets? That's right. That's right. It's going to get harder. The older they get, it gets harder. You know, when you see an 11-year-old so hard, you realize it's a lot sooner than we think to get to them. When you see an 11-year-old that just doesn't want nothing to do with God, zero, I'm telling you, it tells you that there's a we we got a lot of ground to cover to get. If an 11-year-old can reject Jesus, think about that 11-year-old can reject even the the thought of Jesus. Our wind is a lot narrower than we think to get to them. Um, and it's not that we're trying to get them to say a prayer. That's not it at all. If that happens, then that's fine. I'll go with it. What we're trying to get them for is the start of the path. See, if salvation is a process or a path, remember this. If salvation is a path, it has a beginning and it has an end. It has a beginning and it has an end. What's the beginning? I'm going to tell you I don't think the beginning's the Holy Ghost. I mean, what good is it for me to come get the Holy Ghost if I don't know my need? You just tell me I need a Holy Ghost, I need to speak in tongues, but I don't know why I need all that. I don't know who I am. I don't have an identity as a fallen being, a, a carnal man. You're just having me up there to get me the Holy Ghost. Well, that's not the beginning of things. That's part of it. That is the beginning of something, and we'll get there. That is the beginning of something significant for that child, but that's not the beginning of that process. So we need those things. Um, so you, from the time they are old enough to walk to age of 11, this is what I put. I put 11. I will give as far as 13 before it gets really difficult, but I'm going to say 11. Age of 11 there should be an active and consistent pursuit of that child's salvation every single day. My life's on hold. Everything about me is on hold. It's all about salvation of this child, getting them on the path as soon as possible. That takes putting myself down. That takes laying myself aside. That takes putting down my phone long enough to help my child win them and show them the air of who they are from the womb. See, if we don't do this, we'll lose the generation. We'll lose them. All the while, we'll say, we don't understand. We, we were born, they were born here. They grew up here. I mean, they had all these teachings. They had all, listen, how many people do you know that grew up in the body of Jesus Christ who had all the teachings and all the revelations given to them, and they're gone? You know why? I'm going to tell you why. I believe they weren't put on the path of salvation soon enough. I believe some of it was just kind of left to itself to morph. Our children are not going to morph and end up by accident on the path of salvation. They're just not going to morph into it. Yes, sir. I think it, yes, I think it's a combination. I think, and the parents could be doing their job, but, you know, it's got to be consistent. See, consistency is a key. Um, but I know for a fact that there's some thought processes that just bringing our children to church is enough. It's not enough. It's not enough. Listen, it's not enough for us. Let's be honest. It's not enough for us. So here we got strength of mind to some degree and more knowledge and understanding. And it's not enough for us. It sure ain't going to be enough for them. 
So that's, you know, we, we take that. I mean, I, I know that it might be in our minds that um, this salvation thing of our children is just going to somehow magically happen. It's just going to just morph into this, this wonderful thing. Because they think it doesn't take an active role. It takes an active role to get this, to accomplish this. Um, so it's a constant pursuit of your child's salvation. The other one is a constant day in and day out discipling of your child's heart. A day in and day out discipling of your child's heart. That means you're sitting down and you're discipling them. You're helping discipline them in the things of the Lord, the spiritual things of God. Um, we're going to get to a really interesting word here in a little bit. This might be a little bit longer than I thought, um, which is usually the case. Because um, I really want to cover this, really. I think this is paramount. We're in a situation in our church right now that our children are really reaching critical ages, and some of them are starting to pass those critical ages. And if we are just now laying this groundwork, we're behind on the eight ball. We're behind. We've got to start laying this as soon as possible. Um, so here, we need to lead our children to the path of salvation. That's the goal, to lead our children to the path of salvation. Again, it starts somewhere, and we're going to get to where it starts in a few minutes. Um, again, I'll say this. I'm not saying that we can save our children because we can't. We can't. There's nothing in us that can save anyone. So we need to know that it, only God can save them. And I won't get into all that, but we'll, we'll just leave it at that. God can save our children. He wants to save our children. I would dare say there's very few ever that are like um, Judas. There's very few Judases born in the kingdom of God. You know what I'm saying? We, we might like to say that and say, well, God didn't choose them. Well, I don't necessarily think that's the tr fact. You know, if that's the case, well, anyway, I'll leave it alone. We are to lead them to the only one that can save them, and that's Jesus. That's who we're leading them to, because we're going to go into a lot of things here. So everybody hold on. Let's just read a couple of scriptures first in regards to salvation. Because some people will tell you this. I've heard this said. Well, there's no salvation prayer in the Bible. You know where you set your child down and you pray the prayer of salvation and ask Jesus into your heart and forgive you. Okay, they'll tell you, it's not, and I'll tell you, it's not there. It's not there. But I'll show you that there's many scriptures there that lead us in that direction for that. Now, it may be that we need to understand what that means, which I think we do. Let's go to Acts 16.31. You know, Paul and Silas are in prison here in this chapter, and the prison just shook, and, you know, they're helping everybody that was injured. The guard was afraid for his life. And he said, um, in verse 30, he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? So here the jailer's asking, what do I need to do to be saved? And he said this. This is what Paul said. And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. So we have to, number one, lead them to believing in Jesus. It's a must. We must lead our children into believing in Jesus to be saved. Yes, we must lead them into believing in Jesus to be saved. So they have to confess and believe. Romans 10, 9. So yeah, there's no one specific scripture that says that, but there's scriptures that say that. You know, Romans 10, 9. So if you're wondering where that concept came from about asking, praying, and asking, it's coming from these scriptures. It's a combination of scriptures. It's a combination of thought that runs throughout the Word of God. Just like if you come to the Lord for the first time in your life, as an adult, what do you have to do? You have to confess who you are, 
what you are, believe Jesus can save you from your past sins, it's no different for our children. It's the same exact process for them. It doesn't change because they're 10 or 5 or 7 or 8 and I'm 30. It doesn't change. It's still the exact same process. Um, but Romans 10, 9 says, and here salvation is for everyone is what this is talking about. But 10, 9 says, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God had raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Okay, that's pretty cut and dry. So we know that you have to confess, you have to believe, you have to know that he raised Jesus from the dead, and you'll be saved. And you'll be saved. So they have to come and then go down and skip down to verse 13 there. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So the thought runs through the scriptures. It's, it's through the word of God how to be saved. Let's go to Psalms 144. Psalms 1, 144 verse 12. Because I'm going to talk a little bit about a greenhouse for a few minutes. Because if, if, if the salvation process is going to get them on the path and it's going to work, then we have to create a greenhouse inside our homes. And that's going to be very, very detailed. It's not just a haphazard environment. Psalms 144 says this. So this is what our children are like. In these crucial years, this crucial window. Hey, sister. Oh, you're fine. In the crucial years of their life, this is what this is talking about. In 144.12, he says, That our sons may be as plants grown up in their youth, and our daughters may be as cornerstones polished after the similitude of a palace. All right, the plants there is what I want to focus on. Because they're tender. See, he grew up as a tender plant is what the scripture says. So in these crucial years of development, they're tender. They're very tender. And in knowing that, we have to have a very controlled environment inside of our homes to meet that tendon, tenderness. If we don't, then we're going to risk a hardness developing or even the plant dying. Not gaining root, not gaining ground, it'll die. And I'll give you these. Fathers and mothers need to build a greenhouse around your plants. Um, and that's more than just bringing them to church on Sundays and Wednesdays. It's more than that. Because a greenhouse will help get our children on the path of salvation. So I... Y'all know what a greenhouse is, right? I'm sure everyone here does. Do you know why they have greenhouses? Do you know why they use greenhouses? Well, it's, yes, but it's really to control the environment. See, it's to control the environment. When it's cold outside, the greenhouse is warm inside. When it's warm, too hot outside, the greenhouse is cool inside. If it's too dry outside, the greenhouse is wet inside. If it's too wet outside, the greenhouse reduces moisture inside. So it's to control the elements. It's to control the environment around the plants. And our homes should be a greenhouse. Everything we have in our home should be to control the environment of that tender plant growing. Now you might ask what that, so greenhouse is used to help establish new plants. And that's what all of our children are. They're new plants. So the greenhouse helps establish our children as new plants to help those plants get enough roots. See, the plants don't live in the greenhouse all their lives. See, we're raising those plants inside the greenhouse to eventually be taken out of the greenhouse and placed somewhere else. In their own homes, in their own lives, and in their ministries in the church, wherever they're going to be adorned in the kingdom of God, we, they grew up in a greenhouse. 
so that when they get out in their environments, they're strong enough to withstand. They can withstand the heat of the day. They can withstand the cool of the night. They can withstand the rainy season. They can withstand the dry seasons. That's what a greenhouse does. It gets the plants to a place where the roots are strong enough they can venture outside the greenhouse now. And that's like our children. The greenhouse effect isn't got anything to do with the environment outside around us. We can have a greenhouse effect inside of our children. And that means they are strong. They're strong. A greenhouse also provides protection. A greenhouse protects those tender plants and those growing beginnings of the years of its early stages, the greenhouse protects the plants from the negative elements of the world around it. The greenhouse protects from the negative elements of the world around it. So our homes, I want us to, I'm trying to parallel these two pictures. Our home should be like the greenhouse. It's protecting our children in these crucial tender years of their growing. It's protecting them from the elements of the world. They're going to face them sooner or later anyway. You know, I am for sheltering our children for a season. I'm absolutely for it. You know, I'm not against sheltering our kids for a season at all. And I think as our children grow and mature, then that changes that sheltering looks different it starts to change a little bit more um it grows with them see that that sheltering grows with them um another thing a greenhouse protects year after year all year round it protects year after year all year round it protects those plants it's constantly sitting there in place to keep the environment just right for those plants to grow the way they're supposed to grow. I had a, for an object lesson with the kids, I went out to Food Line and got one of those chicken containers. As a matter of fact, we did a Bible study with Chris and Michelle, and I had all of the kids do it. And it was the chicken containers with the black bottoms and the clear tops, and they put the rotisserie chickens in and you buy them. I got a bunch of empty ones. And I had them put soil in there and plant it and create a greenhouse because that's something significant about that greenhouse. The greenhouse helps maintain proper heat. You need to write that down. There should be a proper zeal in your house for this process. A proper passion in our homes for our children to hit that path of salvation as soon as possible. To enter that path. I mean, just get walk right on that thing as soon as we can get them there. And that greenhouse <coughs> helps maintain the proper heat. You know, you need heat for a plant to grow. You need heat for a plant to grow. That means that heat has to come from us. Because they can't produce their own heat right now. These children in these developmental years can't produce their own heat. They need our heat. They need our passion, our zeal, our fervency, our want to please God, to be spilling over onto them and providing the proper heat for their plant. The other one a greenhouse does is helps maintain proper moisture inside. See, our home should have the proper moisture inside. That means the right amount of Holy Ghost, the right amount of spirit, spiritual things of God inside our home on a regular, consistent, day-to-day -day basis, maintaining moisture in the air. <laughs> you ever go into someone's house, we ought to feel moisture in the air of our houses. Yes. You need me to go back? <laughs> Yeah, we're going we're gonna to get there. I'm gonna, it's going to be all broken down. This is just, we're really going to start getting into some details of how to create this greenhouse. Yeah, because it's, it's, it's a lot to it. It's not, you know, it takes a lot of work to build a greenhouse. And inside these greenhouses, I don't know if you've ever seen a, a um, commercialized greenhouse, 
there's a lot of electronics and devices and computers, and they're, they're constantly monitoring and maintaining everything in that thing. They're maintaining every single circumstance in that greenhouse is monitored and dealt with daily. That's pretty detailed. And our homes are going to have to be just as detailed. Um, but we're going to get there. The other one is it helps maintain the moisture. Um, it also, here's the other thing. A greenhouse helps dissipate the light properly. You've been in a greenhouse in the middle of the day, the light is evenly spread out across the greenhouse. It's not concentrated in one area. See, if you take a plant and concentrate the light in one area too long, you set that plant in that direct light too long, what's going to happen to it? It's going to burn it up. So a greenhouse disperses the light evenly. Properly, there's a proper balance in the home of what we're working on. We're not just pinpointing one thing. We've got a proper balance of light working in these children's lives. It's a, all over their life. It's in multi, multiple areas, not just one specific area. We're working on more than one area at a time. Um, so it helps maintain the light and evenly disperses the light. And that's spread out throughout the day. So you think about that, the, the devotions, the Word of God, the setting down at the table, the getting up, you're dispersing the light evenly throughout the day. You're giving it to them evenly. Not just at dev devotions in one time in the morning. That's not proper disbursement of light. Not just on Sundays at church. Not just on Wednesdays at church. That's not a proper disbursement of light. That's one concentrated beam. And you hope that was enough. And it could have been too much. You know, but you have to spread it out throughout the week. Give them light all week long. Um, so as parents, we are to have a greenhouse. And every element should be controlled in this greenhouse. And we're going to get into these here in just a second. Um, and it's very important in these developmental years that we control these elements. We just don't let elements run wild. We just don't let anything in our greenhouse. We don't just let anything into our children's minds, into their hearts. It's, this is detail. You don't just let anything in the greenhouse. Matter of fact, that they find, uh, they're called silk moths in our greenhouse. You know, they got to get those silk moths out of those greenhouses. Do you know why? They'll destroy those plants. They'll eat those plants. There's things that, as parents, we can't let into our homes in these crucial part of the years of their development. If so, it'll eat at the a canker worm on what we're doing with them. It'll eat like a palmer worm on their lives. And all the while, you don't notice it till you go to get the crop. And when you go to get the crop, there's nothing there. You're like, well, I don't understand. They were here. They heard what we heard. So you got to do a proper maintaining of this. It's, it's very detailed. Um, there will be a time when you'll be able to take them from the greenhouse. And that's the goal. The goal is not to keep them in the greenhouse. See, if we keep them in the greenhouse, we failed. There's a time coming that they'll be able to leave the greenhouse. There's a time coming whether we want them to or not, they're going to leave your greenhouse. Uh, but what we've done through those years, those crucial development years are going to matter. Every element controlled consistently. That's the word. I want you to write that word down. Consistently controlled. Nothing gets in. And here's where I think you asked about how to maintain the heat or how to develop that moisture. I think this is what, how we're going to do that. Number one, the word is consistent. We have to be consistent in the things of God. We have to be consistently spiritual ourselves. We can't just be spiritual on Sundays and Wednesdays and expect the right results. It's a consistent spirituality that we're doing here. Now, now I'm going to give you just from our point of view. That's me and Sister Puckets. And she can add anytime you want to, you can add anything. Um, when we got this understanding, when the Lord gave it to us, we didn't get it of our own. And I'm not saying we got it all right. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that at all. I just can only pull from what we've experienced. That's it. I can pull from what I've seen in other homes. I can pull from what I've seen other fruit end up like. Um, but what I'm pulling from, so you know, when I tell you these things, is just from what we've experienced, experienced in what we've been doing. All entertainment. You've got to write this down. All entertainment that our children participated in 
from the time they walked, and I don't know exactly how many years it went. I'm going to say at least for the first 10 years. Minimal is what I would think. Um, what do you think? Somewhere around there. Because I was sitting down trying to figure it all out, but we've gotten old, so we forgot some of this. Um, <laughs> Brother Gary. But every form of entertainment that our children laid their eyes on was talking about Jesus or salvation. Everything. And I mean everything. Do you know how exhausted Hermie made me? I got to the point where Hermie would bring me to tears sometimes. I'm serious. Think about that whole wanting to be that butterfly his whole life, you know. But all entertainment. So you want to keep the heat and the right moisture. Then we got to keep the right environment inside that greenhouse. All entertainment should point to Jesus and to salvation. All entertainment. And um, we, we, we let them listen to, it was Steve Green. With, um, what's that little video they did? Say it again. Yeah, hide them in your heart. Hermes, Theos, all these videos, the Nest series, every single, this is all they watched. I mean, it's all they watched. I, can, I, I don't even like them, I mean, because I've seen them so much. We had the Nest books. They would sit down and look at the Nest books. Every single form of entertainment, and I'm not exaggerating. We didn't let them listen to PAR. They didn't listen to contemporary Christian music on the radio. They listened to Brother Minson. They listened to, oh, I wrote it down. They listened to Steve Green. Uh, they listened to Bible songs. They listened to kids singing. They listened to nothing but those things. Well, Brother Puckett, that's extreme. No, that's a greenhouse. They're developing. They're developing right now. Anything that gets in is going to affect their direction. Anything. So if, I'm, if, if our goal is to get them to the path of salvation, then every single thing we allow in our greenhouse should get them there, help assist us in getting them on that path. They didn't watch these series of when they watch them now. They didn't watch them then. They did not watch those series of When Calls the Hearts and all that stuff at their young ages. There's too much in there. There's too many other ingredients in there that they're going to get their eyes on that's going to keep them in a different direction that we're working on. So when they were in these crucial years, they didn't, that's why I'm saying as they age, they're going to get to get out of that greenhouse a little bit more. You know, they can sit down and watch Wind Calls the Heart now and things like that um, because the root system was strong enough. You know, I, I measure, I watch them. If I see an adverse effect in anything they watch, we stop. We stop it. You can change, see their spirit change, you see their attitude change. Um, their hunger, their appetite might change. See, in these crucial years... This is significant. I would have told you that when I first heard it, I thought it was crazy. But I'm telling you now, it's significant. It's significant in what we're trying to do. Are we trying to save them? Mm -mm. No. I can't save them. The only thing we can do as parents is get them on the path of salvation as soon as possible. They got to get on that path and get to walking. And we need everything in our environment assisting us in that process. Everything. Um, the, all the music, all the movies. My kids didn't watch anything. I wrote them down, matter of fact. All the ones we watched as young people. Emperor's New Groove. You know, they're just now watching those movies at this age. They didn't just get to watch those movies. Why? Because it's so bad? Well, no, they just ain't working on what we're working on. You know, they weren't working on that. We had to get them across to a path and get them established on that path, walking on that path before we needed any other disruptions because we were going to have plenty on our own. So they didn't get to watch. I wrote them down. What was it? Pixar was one of them. You know, you know just the first time a year ago, my kids watched Monsters Incorporated. About a year ago was the first time they watched Monsters Incorporated. Now, is Monsters Incorporated terrible to watch? No, it's not. We watched them. But it wasn't at all conducive to getting them on that path first as soon as possible. And we knew we had enough distractions in our own inconsistencies, Brother Gary, that we didn't need any extras. <laughs> we, we didn't need any extra help messing it up. We had plenty of help messing it up on our own. So they didn't play video games. It was just not even.
been a year ago or two years ago that I let Elijah, for the first time, put a video game in his hand. And that's very limited at this point. Very limited. Because these are things that are, aren't conducive to the salvation process. They're just not. They're not conducive to the path of salvation. I've seen them hurt more than help. I've seen them harm. I've seen them distract. I've seen them slow down pace. Because they will slow down pace. Um, so they, uh, Disney, Pixar, and here's the thing. They were putting nutrients. They're going to put nutrients in our kids. They're going to add things to our soil. They just are. And they're doing it on a regular basis. Well, in these crucial years, I'm going to tell you now, these crucial years, this is where we should be the strictest. This 1 to 13 years old, man, they ought, people ought to look at us and say, you're going to damage that kid. You know, my mom and dad used to say it all the time, you're going to hurt those kids. You know, they're not going to be able to be socialized. And I thought to myself, you have no idea one day they're going to be able to walk in this society and be a light to this world. But it takes me keeping them from that system for a while until we get them strong enough to get out there. Because the goal is to get them out there winning people. The goal is to get them out there helping people. That's the goal. But to do that, these first few years of their lives, they're crucial. We, have, we can't be sloppy. We can't be. And I'm saying if we have been, let me say this so no one leaves here with, oh, it's hopeless. If we have been and we've done it out of ignorance, you know God forgives that and will come up and help us make up the difference. God can help us make up the difference from ignorance. You know, and ignorance isn't just because I, I, the word for, that I'm dumb. Sometimes ignorance is what I told, what we talked about the car. Sometimes ignorance is just a mere fact I'm ignoring. I'm ignoring what I've heard. I'm ignoring what I knew. I, I ignored what I've seen. I ignored results. I have found out that you, when it comes to child raising, none of us have to reinvent the wheel. None of us have to reinvent the wheel. So it's like when you have my, my wife, she's out of the room, so I'll talk about it real fast. Um, she makes this recipes, desserts, and I'm like, hey, did you follow the recipe? She's like, well, no, you know, I added a little bit here, added a little. So she always puts her little touch on it, you know. And sometimes we think we just need to put our little touch on things. Well, sometimes our little touch might be just enough to make it turn out the wrong way. To make it turn out not the way the Lord intended it to turn out. You know, this is a process of the Lord, by the way. Once our job, Brother Eddie, is to get them on the path, to get them to see their need, to get them to see they need a Savior, to get them to see without Jesus they are going to die and go to the grave. Once they see that and they accept, I need to change course, they get in that path and, they, and everything about us, we're kind of like that coach in Facing the Giants where he starts to yell, come on, don't quit, don't quit. That's what we're doing now. We're continuing to keep going on this path. Don't change course. You know, easy, you're getting close to the edge over here. And we're constantly keeping them inside that path of salvation. And all of us working together in each other's homes, in each other's environments, we're working on keeping our children on that path of salvation. That's why it's so important even the church gets united in a lot of these things and some things. But, and, and yes, uh, they'll be able to handle the world at some point. That's the goal. They will be able to handle the world at some point. And they'll be able to handle some things in the latter years of their life that there's no way they could have handled in the former years. There's no way. They didn't have the wherewithal to do it. So let's go into here. Um, so what does it mean to lead them to salvation? Well, first off, it means that we've led them to a place to where they see their wretchedness. That they see their wretchedness and can acknowledge it. That means you have to teach them that they're fallen from the womb, that they're fallen from birth. You have to teach them that without the Lord, they're destined for the grave. And you have to teach them that they're born a sinner in need of salvation. You have to lead them to a place where they can acknowledge their wickedness. In that same 
kind of terminology, you lead them to a place where they can see the filthiness of their flesh. See, with our children, we didn't coach them into getting on their knees and saying the prayer. We really didn't. We, we let the Lord, we did all that we could do to help them see this right here. You're wretched. You're, we're filthy without the Lord. We're destined for the grave without the Lord. And we need the Lord to save us. We, we just, and everything in the environment pointed in that direction. That's all they seen and heard and observed with their eyes. Every gate that they have, their eyes, their ears, was covered with salvation in that path. So when we were sitting in McDonald's parking lot, Hannah could say, Daddy, I feel Jesus pulling on my heart. Well, no one coached her. No one coached her to do that. We didn't set her down and say, okay, say this prayer and everything's going to be all right. You know, we sat down and told her, you need to ask for forgiveness of your sins and ask the Lord to be the Lord of your life and, and that you want to go on with him. That's all we did. You know, because she had to see that. And, and Elijah did the same thing, not in McDonald's parking lot. Hadassah did the same thing. I'm sure some of your children have done the same thing. But that's... They're acknowledging. See, that's something happening between them and the Lord. And that's what we're trying, giving him something to work with. We're putting the right material in there that Jesus can work on something. Another thing that what it means to lead them to salvation is lead them to a place in their lives where they recognize that they're filthy. They're filthy. The other part is to help them see that only Jesus can rescue them from the sentence of death that's put on them. Only Jesus can rescue them from the sentence of death that was put on them. The other one is leading them to a place of saving knowledge. Leading them to the place of a saving knowledge. What does that mean? That place is where all of a sudden it clicks in their heart that they're a sinner in need of forgiveness and saving. See, everything in our environment that we're using should be Helping them get to that place. See, we need all, I can't stress this enough, these crucial years in the environments of our homes. I can't stress it enough. I'm telling you, this is crucial to what path they're going to pick as they get older. The other one. The salvation process is the beginning. So everyone knows this. So you don't think it's just this little prayer that you can't find in the scriptures. It's the process or the beginning that someone acknowledges and recognizes their need for Jesus. See, the salvation process is the beginning of someone recognizing their need for Jesus. And that's leading our children to salvation, is leading them to a place where they recognize their need for Jesus. That means that's what I'm working on. That's what we're working on. Uh, that's what, that means if I have to get... Nest films, and I have to get the Keith Greens or the is it Keith Green, Stephen Green or Keith Green or Brother Minson or whoever I can, whatever I can. The whole entire environment is is all helping me get them to that place. Everything. Yes, yeah. Everything's helping me that to get them there. And that means, you know, there's been times and still to this day, you go through your house and there's things that are in there that it's not helping you get them there. You got to get it out. You know, it, it might be hard. That means they can't watch anymore. They can't listen to it anymore. They can't read it anymore. It's done. It's over. It's not helping. It's not assisting. Yes. And listen, that takes, listen, you know how many times we watched cartoons and animations and, and we didn't get to watch very many adult movies. We didn't. We didn't. 
you know, if we went to bed, maybe we'd watch them together or something, but it wasn't, we didn't spend our day watching what we wanted to watch and just brought the kids in with us. No, we, everything, we tried. I'm not saying we did it consistently. I'm sure we messed up. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying that we did have a united mindset that this was the way we were going to do it. And look, we're still seeing it. You know, it's still, we can still say that it's still out there. You know, it's still, but there's, I'm going to give you four milestones to look for. Four milestones to look for that you've got your child on the path. When you know that you've got them there, these are four things to look for. Number one. that our children, our child, comes to a place where they receive and believe. They came to the knowledge that they are fallen and in need of a Savior. They came to that knowledge. Not you coached them, not you coaxed them, not you coerced them, but they, something clicked and they came to an understanding, wait a minute, I need this. That's the first milestone you look for. And that very first milestone right there should be an indicator to let you know. And let us know. They just got on the path. So that's, that's good news right there, man. They just got on the path. See, when your child's wanting it, they're, they're confessing to you, they're telling you, listen, Daddy, I feel Jesus pulling on my heart. And you didn't coax them that day. You didn't coach them that day. You didn't give them a script. And they say that to you. Then you ought to absolutely encourage every one of us to know they just stepped on the path to salvation. They got on there. Number two is that they want to be baptized in water. And that means that you've done a good job explaining now that they're on that path of salvation and now that they may have gotten a little bit older and they've grown a little bit, it may be time that they want to do what we would call water baptism. Well, we've got to explain that to them. We've got to explain to them what that is. That's not just a ritual of something we do. It's not just, well, it's, I guess we've got to get them baptized. They're old enough now. They've got to understand that that's a public confession. You are acknowledging publicly and you want people around you to know that you have chosen this path. So you got on it, but now you choose to stay this path. You want to stay this course. Now you want to be baptized and make a public confession that I want the old ways to go and the new ways to remain. So you, that's a second milestone. It's not just a milestone that we should make light of that, well, I guess you need to be baptized. Well, you haven't been baptized yet, and you haven't been baptized yet. No, we need to make sure they understand that and that they want it. See, it's not just you, you're, you're making a proclamation to all those publicly around you. I'm staying this course. I want on this course. I'm staying on this course. So you got to have water baptism. And that's that they want to make a public confession of that knowledge. And it's not just they want to do it because it's a religious thing to do. And then number three. Because see, if you think about it, we started this process before we ever got to number three. Number three is they want the Holy Ghost. Yes, sir. Well, it should, it should start to happen. Things should start lining up, start falling in place the way we're, we're expecting. If, if we've got them on the right path, we've laid the right groundwork, these milestones should start to happen. We should start to see it, not something we've coached them into. There's, and there's something in them, they want it. They're wanting it. But it's not, not necessarily a plug and play. I know what you're saying. It's easy. It's, it's sliding in place. Yeah, these things begin to slide in place. If you don't see them sliding in place, the groundwork probably wasn't laid right somewhere. 
See, if, if they're 15, 16 years old, they're not saved, they haven't acknowledged the Lord as their Savior, and they're not got the Holy Ghost, I mean, I'm telling you now, nuclear alarms should be going off in our minds. Something bad has happened here. Because the groundwork isn't laid. Because if the groundwork's laid, and I, you know, I, I'm, I know some people can say that God didn't choose them. I'm not a big fan of that doctrine. I'm just not. I think the mere fact that you were a child in the mother's womb and you were brought to life and you were brought forth and given a chance, you've been chosen. Whether or not you stay faithful to God's choosing you or not, that's up to you. But God's chosen that he wants you in his kingdom. Right. That's right. That's right. That's exactly right. So, yes, these things should start to fall in place. But not without work still. See, it's not just without now. It's, it's not that I've wound up for the last 11 years and now I ain't got nothing to do. Now it's just going to all autopilot and go. No, that's not true. Because if I see something in my child, so, because as they age, they still might glitch. What I mean by glitch is, Brother Eddie, they may still have something in there they're trying to overcome that can't get them to the next milestone yet. Well, that's, we're actively working. We're back onto the path of salvation. We're back trying to get them to the goal. We're not trying to force them. We're not trying to make them. We're trying to tell them we're here with you. We're going to pray with you. We're going to assist you in this. We're going to help you get there. And the whole time, the Lord's helping them as well. But they want the Holy Ghost baptism. Now, I'm a, you need to write this down. And when they want the Holy Ghost, that means they've got to understand. Without the Holy Ghost... There's no new creature inside them yet. There's no new man without that Holy Ghost. See, up to this point, everything we've laid in that groundwork from the time they were one to the time they're 10 or 11 is to get them to the place where they've acknowledged the one in them is the old man. The one in them is the dead man. The one in them has got the sentence of death on him. And as they grow and mature and begin to hit these milestones, the next milestone is they re recognize, I need the new nature in me now. I need that new birth. That's where the new birth comes in. Okay? This whole process is the path of salvation. From the time that we've been teaching them they're a sinner and need to be saved, all of that's in there to get them to this milestone of getting that new birth they need. They need it because without that new birth, they don't have the power. There's nothing in them that can do good. There's just maybe put perfume on a pig as a statement, they say. They've made their old man look good or they're, they've just made it sound good. But there's no power to overcome in them. It's no different than being under the law right there. There's nothing in them to give them power to go on. They're stuck there. And that's the danger of not getting them over that milestone is they're stuck there without that new nature in them. See, that Holy Ghost baptism is a new nature in you. That's what that is. And without that, they're still stuck with their old man. And so that's the milestone. So they've got to understand the Holy Ghost is a new birth. And that's where the divine nature enters them. But listen, we're still, that everything we've set up to this, see, some people think that's it right there. Let's just get our kids to get the Holy Ghost. I'm sorry, there's a whole lot of people that got the Holy Ghost that aren't serving the Lord right now. They did not want nothing to do with the Lord, and, and they faked everything they could fake to get to that point. And once they got the Holy Ghost, everybody left them alone. There was no groundwork laid to get them to that place. And when you get them to that place, Brother Eddie, they have no foundation to stand on now. They just got speaking in tongues. That's what I got. They got none of that extra foundation that was laid throughout those years of their life to give them something, that rock Jesus, to stand on. Because who all here speaks in tongues every day? Well, that's good. <laughs> she, she got it. But I'm saying, so, so here, new birth, that's you own that rock daily. Daily. But can I tell you something? Everything that we've doing, the salvation process to get them on that path starts way back here before we ever get to milestone number three. Milestone number three is not the beginning of salvation. The beginning of salvation is going all the way back and explaining to them who they are, what they've been cursed with, who can redeem them from that, why they need to be saved, why they need to be forgiven to get them to the Holy Ghost. It's all part of that process. So many people rush just to get the number three milestone. Let's just get on speaking in tongues and everything's good. 
Well, that's not true. That's not true. That's someone that just didn't want to lay the groundwork. That's someone that just didn't want to take the extra time it takes to get them to step three. So here, the Holy Ghost of the new birth, it's where the divine nature enters into them, and now they have power to resist that old man. They've got power now. See, before they were just like the law. They just had to go once a year and get forgiven. But now they have something in them that can resist it now. And see, that's a milestone for our children to get that Holy Ghost so they can resist that devil in them. And number four, the fourth milestone, and there could be others for all of you, but I'm just saying I think these are absolutely four indicators whether or not they've entered the path of salvation or not. And number four is that our children will reach a place in Jesus, and that's spiritual maturity, that they'll reach a place in Jesus that they publicly proclaim Jesus as their own. As their own. When a child stands up in church and says, it's my Jesus now. He's my Lord and he's my Savior. When that transition from mommy and daddy's Jesus transitions over to now he's their Lord, he's their Savior. Man, we just hit another milestone. See, and once that milestone hits... They're walking on their own with their Lord now. They have started a path with the Lord. They're on that path. They're established. Now they're walking with Jesus. And we're on the sidelines. We're with them. We're coaching them. We're instructing them still. We're still helping them. That doesn't mean we stop. We never, listen, we don't stop till the day we lose our last breath helping our children across the finish line. No. No. Now, that doesn't mean I call them every day and say, hey, listen, you need to be doing this and you need to be doing that. That's not true. I'm always here for them. And every time I'm ever around them, I'm going to encourage them to keep going. Don't stop. Stay on the path. And, and you constantly, as, even as we age, you keep encouraging them to go on. So it's no longer mommy and daddy's Jesus. It's their Jesus, their Lord, their Savior. And you hear them say what God's doing with them and for them, and how he's talking to them, and how he's dealing with them. See, those are indicators they're on the path. They're on the path. If you're not hearing those things, and we're not getting there, then listen, we ought to be concerned that they're on the path yet. That means we got, that doesn't mean it's too late. That means we go back, and if that means we strip our home of everything, and we clean our house of everything, and we put the greenhouse back in order, we put the details in there, we get everything back, the right, and we start to get those children onto that path. They're already, already pre-programmed for the path of death. They're already on it. They're on it from the time they take their first breath. We're doing everything we can to get them to see that and get them to want the path of salvation. Because, see, we're all still on the path of salvation. We're all here, sitting here today, on that path of salvation. We're still walking that path. We've got to get them on that path. See, this is a process. No, this isn't a one-time prayer. No, this isn't a one-time event. This is something you're constantly getting them in that direction, helping them move them in that direction, and the Lord's helping you as well. But this is our burden. This isn't everyone else's burden. See, this isn't, like I go back and said, this isn't just, you know how many, listen, there's some, been people I've heard say these words. I did everything the pastor told me to do. And they've lost about all their children to the world. Okay? It wasn't the pastor's job. The pastor's job is to equip the homes. We equip the homes and the homes go in and, and erect the environment. They erect that greenhouse. They set that thing. They build that greenhouse. They clean those things out. They get those things out of there. They set the environment. They, they pay attention to the details. They manage the greenhouse. The ministry's job is just to help you understand you need to build it you need to work it you need to maintain it you need to stay on top of it it's not the ministry's job to bring your children to salvation we're assisting the ministry in the church is assisting 
all parents to get their children to the path of salvation. We're assisting you. Not just assisting, we're also equipping. But in the end, Brother Ben, you've got to till the ground. We've got to farm this crop God gave us and our children. There's three verses I want to give you, and then I'll stop. Yes. Yeah, with the movies, you need to transition those out. And they need to be, for Logan's right now, Christian-based. With the message in there. The message of the Lord, the message of heaven, the message of salvation. And, like, that's all our children heard. And that's what he needs to hear right now. He needs, because if you're going to clean those things out, the scripture says if you take and clean the house, we've got to put something in there. So you put back it. Now, here's the danger. I'll tell you where you're, what you're seeing. Once I tasted sugar for the first time, Brother Gary, I've been hooked for life. <laughs> I've been hooked for life, right? Sugar's delicious, isn't it? What if I never tasted sugar? See what I'm saying? So what's happened, some things we've tasted of the world, and now the things of God don't satisfy them. They just don't. It programmed our taste buds. It programmed our appetites. So here's what you need. The Lord, number one, prayer, the word of God, and you need to cultivate that environment daily. And eventually, I hated, listen, I hated Mexican food before I got married. I hated it. Now, you ask me how many times I've ever eaten it before I got married, I'll tell you none. I hated it because my mom and dad hated it. Never tried it. Brother Gary, once I ate it, I love Mexican food, brother. I love it. So what you love, they love. What you hate, they'll hate. But you, it's not too late. You start cultivating those things now. That means making changes in your own life, making those adjustments now. Um, and that's the danger of having professional actors on the screen versus pure flicks actors on the screens, okay? Let's just be honest. That's the danger. Once they see that level, it's hard for them to accept this over here. That's why in these crucial years, it's important. Listen, you need to keep it as simple as possible in the kingdom of God. You just need to. Just like Denny Kennison taught in the book, he never let his children ride motorized vehicles, motorcycles, scooters, because he said the moment he did, he knew the bike would no longer satisfy them. They'd no longer want to pedal a bicycle. They'd want a motorized vehicle from that point on. You know how true that is? Yeah, I mean, think about it. Take your kid to Dollywood and put them on those rides and then take them to the park down the street. <laughs> they're like, yeah, right. This ain't going to work. Yeah, they don't want nothing to do with it. You know, they're, they're looking for a way to make it more, jumping off the top of the slide now because we need that extra excitement. We need something. So that's why it's very, very important what appetites they develop now. You'll have to fight with later. You'll have to wrestle with them later. Yes. Right, yes. Well, like, I mean, maybe Hermie won't work for Logan. Okay? Superbook. We have Superbook's a good one. So, so entertainment geared to his age group and whatever. Because you look at the age group of the movie, and I say from age is blank to blank. Okay, then you gear that with those messages in there. 
and start feeling because if you just take it all away and I feel there's going to be this resentment, animosity, anger build up because there's nothing in there to suffice that now. The Chosen. The Chosen is really good. Yeah. The Kendrick Brothers movie, Courageous, Faith of Our Fathers. Faith of Our Fathers. Yeah. Yeah. What's the other one? Facing the Giants. Torch lighters. Get y'all a piece of cake, man. Knock it out. It's good. It's delicious. I'll give y'all a couple of verses here in a second we can end with because uh, I hope you understand this is a very crucial part of our children's development right here these years um, I've, I've said it I always said I'm not a big firm believer that they'll grow out of things I'm more of a firm believer they're going to grow into it they're just going to figure out a way how to trick me to think they've grown out of it they've grown into it um, so we've got to be mindful of that let's go over here to First John it's interesting if you look at this. I know you might think this is strange, but I've always had a favorite verse in John. First John. Um, it's actually um, the verse that I really like is in Third John, but I'm going to give you three verses to get there. First John 1, 4 says this. Uh, and these things write we unto you that your joy may may be full okay do you know there's nothing that brings you more joy than seeing your children on the path of salvation nothing there's nothing to bring you that kind of level of joy second john 1 4 which is interesting it's in the same area there second john 1 4 says this i rejoice greatly that I found of thy children walking in truth as we have received a commandment from the Father. So again, this, the joy is directly related to the children here, to know your children are in the truth. And then 3 John 1, 4 says this, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. And that's what it's about. If we can finish our course in our lives and all of our children are on the path of salvation, man, there ain't nothing's going to bring you that kind of joy. Nothing's going to. Listen, if your parents are serving the Lord now and you and your siblings are on that path, understand how much joy that brings them. Think about you as a parent, how much joy that would bring you to know that all your children are safely, securely on that path. That's, that's what we're here to do. We've got to, listen, the process of salvation is just that, a process. And our job is to get them to the path as soon as possible. And, that's, and that looks like what we just explained. That whole process, all the things you've written down. And once we get them there, we'll start to see those milestones pop up. Those Ebenezer's, like your dad would say, are those landmarks will start to pop up that they've received and understand they need a Savior. They want to be baptized by water. They know they need the Holy Ghost, and they publicly proclaim, He's my Jesus. He's my. That's what we're here to work on. And let me tell you something. Some of you are in your absolute crucial years of this process. Some of us are getting into another degree of this, that we're working at a more mature level now, with their thoughts and we're wrestling with more of their mature thinking and, and the uh, things they're seeing and observing and hearing in people. Actually, as they are mature, you know what you deal a lot with? The inconsistencies they start to see around them. Because <laughs> they're starting to identify, you said A plus, or one plus one's two, Dad, in these first 10 years of my life, but now I'm understanding, wait a minute, it doesn't quite look like that. Like you said, why is there inconsistencies there? 
But see, now you're dealing with that. Now you're working on those things to help them see that you're going to see these things. We're going to, we're going to not just see them. We're going to have them. You know? but, so we're at different stages. But you are this, if you're in these age groups of 1 to 13, man, you are absolutely need to get on the ground right now. And you need to be running as hard as you can in this. Because I'm telling you, if they get to 15, 16 years old and they are not on that path of salvation yet, I'm going to roll the dice and say we may miss them. We may miss them if God doesn't supernaturally intervene. If he doesn't supernaturally get that child's heart, we're probably going to miss them. Okay? So these are crucial years. It's not too late for none of us. If, if you're hearing these words and we're all sitting here and we're getting this information now, then it's not too late. Okay? It's not. Well, we got to get to work. It just may mean we have to... You know, if we get on the exit and there's three cars, there are three cars ahead of me now, i got to drive a little bit faster to get called up to them. So you may have to run a little bit faster now. You may have to put a little bit more oomph in it, but it doesn't mean you can't get there because we can get there. Um, I'll tell you, if you aren't reading this book, you're doing yourself an injustice. I mean, I, I tell you, this is a godsend to this assembly. The pursuit of godly seed. Did you see that one? Yeah. The videos, the audios, all that. If you need to, you should be in them. Because I'm going to tell you something. The way this got to us, you remember, your mom found this in a kiosk in Kroger. Okay? This hit this assembly. Just at the time, kids started coming on the scene. Listen, it, the Lord put this ingredient in this church. Listen, I'm not saying it's the full measure of this here. But I'm going to tell you something. These two can go hand in hand. And, man, they're going to work. They are going to work. And then you take, if you've got a child that's a little bit stubborn, you take uh, Brother Davis's message on saving, not Brother Davis in our church or Brother Davis and Wilson, Brother Davis's message on changing the heart of a rebel, and you start to apply that, I'm going to tell you something. Those three full cord, man, that's a strong, you got something strong there to help the generation stand on. Um, when I first heard him, I couldn't stand him. I couldn't. But then something happened. When he put that burden back on my shoulders, and I realized it was no longer anyone else's responsibility but mine. It changed. It changed everything, man. I liked his voice. Then I wanted to hear what he had to say. I needed more. So I'm telling you, if you got this, you should be digging in it. Even if you don't have kids yet, Abby, you should have this down pat before your kid ever hits the scene. Because this coupled with this, man, what a tool. What a tool. The Word of God, and he puts it all in there, but the vision that's in here, the vision he paints, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. So I encourage you. I can't make you. I wouldn't try to make you. I encourage you. Put these together. The Word of God's supreme. Okay, hands down it's supreme. Take this and couple it to that. And, man, just work the system, and it'll work. Any questions? Anything else? Any concerns? Anything anybody else wants to add?